Hi, I'm Eric Johns. I'm the senior pastor at Bethel Church here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I wanted just to greet you personally and let you know that we're thrilled that you have found this video in hopes that it would be an encouragement to your spiritual journey. There may be lots of reasons why you're watching the video. Perhaps you're relocating, perhaps you're homesick or traveling or on the road. One thing that's really important to us is that this would be a supplement and not a replacement for coming to uh, a church uh, fellowship. Uh, God has been really gracious to not only save us from our sin, but to save us into the body of Christ. And church is a place where we come to fellowship with one another, to walk out our spiritual life together under the care and instruction of our pastors and elders. So I'm glad you found this content, and I hope to see you in church real soon. God bless. If you want to open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 8, <coughs> Take a little break here while you're turning your pages. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Let me just also say, by the way, didn't Pastor Mark do an excellent job last week? I was sitting here watching him go through this, one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament, and my thought internally was, our, worship, or our youth pastor preaches better than yours. <laughs> that was my, that's my, that's competitive Eric right there. I just loved it. I was super... Super proud of him. A number of years ago, uh, we were having a garage sale um, at our house. And um, this is, of course, back before we all sold everything on Facebook Marketplace or whatever. And uh, we had some old Christian CDs and some old Christian books and, let's say, various Christian wares. I don't know. They were out and about in some of the things that we were selling. And uh, we had this... Um, during the garage sale, we had this lovely black family drop by, and they were so much fun and full of personality. And the dad was particularly boisterous and charismatic, and he looked around and saw some of these things, and he said with this wonderful intonation, he says, mm, we got some spiritual folk around here. <laughs> and we just loved it. We got the biggest kick out of it and had fun with them. And, um, and we're a family that collects one-liners. And so we... We've kept this one. This one lives on at our house. So I may come down the stairs and find Amy doing her devotions in the morning and say, mm, we got some spiritual folk around here. That's kind of how we roll at home. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to be spiritual? And there's a sense in which uh, it probably it is determined by who you're talking to, Right? Uh, on the one hand, uh, you may talk to somebody and, and hear them say back to you, hey, listen, I'm spiritual, but not religious, right? So what they're telling you is, hey, as far as I know, I'm okay with God as I understand God to be. I'm certain I'm not going to practice whatever you're peddling. Stay away from me, right? That's the subtle message there. Or for some, they might say, they might say that they're spiritual, and by that, they might mean just metaphysical, that they're interested in all kinds of things, say new age, or palm reading, or tarot cards, or uh, something like this. And I was in Barnes & Noble here a couple weeks ago, and I was uh, walking past one of the aisles, and there was a woman in a long flowing dress, and she was just kind of sitting down, camped out in front of this new age mysticism section, and had all these books pulled out and pouring over it, and my pastoral heart just broke, you know. I, I wanted to go over and say, can I take you to a section that's going to help? Um, I, I did not do that. I, hopefully that wasn't disobedience, but um, that's what occurred to me. <clears throat> or uh, maybe within Christianity, somebody will use the term spiritual. And we might think, well, they mean charismatic or Pentecostal or mystical of some kind. And I think today's passage in Romans 8 here shows us how it is that we are truly spiritual. That is, that we are fundamentally changed by the Spirit of God who is within us if we are in Christ. If we are in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within us and is changing us and acting upon us to alter the course and the nature of our life. This is one of these wonderfully Trinitarian passages. Uh, we don't always get to see each of the member of, members of the Godhead at work in the same passage, but here we do. Um, we see the Father orchestrating the plan of salvation 
and we see the Son executing it, carrying it out, and we see the Holy Spirit applying it. We see all three members at work in the salvation of the believer. So I want to give you a little bit of personal background um, uh, for this, for me on this particular issue of spiritual. Uh, I grew up in a conservative Christian home. Uh, my parents are missionaries with the Navigators, so um, I'm a missionary kid, which explains a lot of my issues that you might be well aware of, MK. Uh, we went to conservative Baptist churches pretty much my whole life since I was about you know, eight years old on. And uh, I also went to the Christian school from second grade all the way to high school uh, on that same location. So that's my background. And given that background, I will say that the Holy Spirit has always been for me and people in my circles, I would say, the most suspect member of the Trinity, if I can say that. Or at least when someone starts referring to the Holy Spirit, then that person becomes somewhat suspect. What do you, what do you mean by that? Where are you going with that? Uh, in fact, um, in my friendship group, there were um, three of us boys that hung out an awful lot, and one of the ways we were sort of rebellious is um, we were curious about what the Pentecostal churches were doing across town, so... <laughs> We would go and visit uh, in the evenings for their worship nights to see what all the fuss was about. And uh, one of the friends that I went to school with, she went to, that, she went to the church that was associated with that. And in our church, we had greeters. But in her church, they had what they called ghostbusters, which were no kidding going around performing exorcisms or casting out demons or whatnot, looking to do so. So the slightly different worship scenarios, right? So let me just, I'm just giving you some background here. With with that in mind, I think within um, Christian circles, the Holy Spirit is the most misunderstood, mistaken, and misused member of the triune Godhead. But I want to, and here's, here's how I think it happens. Conservatives, for example, I think we often demote him to a JV member of the Trinity, and Pentecostals, or so, someone on the far other end of the spectrum, think they tend to elevate him to supreme among the Trinity. And the balance here, and it's not, it's not even a balance, what's just true is that our God is triune. Each member is of equal value and dignity and worth and power. They are equal. There is not one uh, that is greater than another. Uh, there's a great old uh, quotation here. It says this, the Trinity... Try to understand it, and you'll lose your mind. But try to deny it, and you'll lose your soul. Okay? We want to understand God as he is. Um, And I think what is often overlooked about the Holy Spirit is the inward work of the Holy Spirit. Much of the conversation and the debate and the heat, so to speak, is about outward manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And what is often neglected is, how is he at work inwardly? What is he doing in us? And my hope is that by the end of this sermon, that we would all be able to say along with our garage sale friends, hmm, we got some spiritual folk in here. And for that not to be suspect, or in fact that we would find that to be with great reassurance. And that is the sort of the word, I think, that, that uh, describes the tenor of this passage, assurance. Uh, so read along with me, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? We can stop right there. That'd be a sermon enough as it is, right? There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because though Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
So let me start with something important here. I don't want to assume this. What is it to be in Christ? Because everything is contingent upon this. If we are in Christ. In Christ does not mean that you have simply heard of him or that you know the Jesus stories from Sunday school or that your spouse is a Christian or grandma or some other family member. <clears throat> to be in Christ means that we ourselves have repented from our sin, that we understand Jesus to be the only atoning sacrifice for sin, that we have turned to him in saving faith, trusting him and him alone, his sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sin and reconcile us to a holy God. And if we have done that, by God's grace and God's power, if we have done that, we are in Christ. And um, if we are in Christ, then we have great assurance. First of all, that we are no longer under condemnation. And I will say, I think this is one of the most difficult things to believe in all of Christianity. Just that really, really, right now, because of Christ, I bear no guilt before God. I have no future condemnation coming. Because all of my sin, past, present, and yet to be committed, have all already been paid for in Christ Jesus. That is incredible news. And if we could but believe that we would be radically transformed by that truth alone. We do need to understand, though, that condemnation was mankind's starting point. That was our default position arriving in planet Earth. Uh, it's not very popular to say that. You know, if I go visit a couple in the hospital who just had a newborn baby and they hand me the little one and I take it in my arms and say, welcome, little sinner. <laughs> mom's going to remember that. Dad will chuckle, but, you know, mom's going to remember that. But it's theologically true. It's theologically true. We are sinners from birth. Even, David even argues that we are sinners in the womb which is an interesting commentary on where life begins from the scriptures. But it is critically important to understand this, and we've tried to establish it very well throughout this series, because here's the thing. If, you, if, you start, if your starting point is that mankind is generally pretty good, fundamentally good, then here's what happens. Then all we seem to need is a little bit of self-improvement and then, honestly, God looks like a bit of a fuss pot. And then the incarnation of Christ looks like overkill. Faith in him as the only option seems absurd. And this father who sends him to do this doesn't look like a loving father, but a divine child abuser. If we start from the point of, we're oh, pretty good, pretty good folks, then that's where we end up. But because of Adam's fall, all mankind was born condemned. Natural born sinners deserving of judgment and death and hell and in deep need of a savior. And if we fail to recognize that, that condemnation was our starting point, then the gospel isn't good news at all. It's just awkward, right? Listen to what John 3.16 says, you know it, but the verses following might add a little extra emphasis for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, oh, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So Jesus doesn't come to condemn us. The condemnation that we were under was the result of the fall and it was clarified and made absolutely, absolutely clear by the giving of the law, right? So between the fall of mankind with Adam and the giving of the law and all of that time, mankind was continuously sinning, continually sinners. But when the law came, the lines were drawn and it showed very precisely where those trespasses were and that they were continuing. Uh, and as we have seen, uh, the law did not save us, could not save us. 
and was never meant to save us. The goodness of the law was that it showed us the badness of ourselves and that we needed Christ. That's what the law achieved. It showed us our need for a savior. But what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending his own son to be the atoning sacrifice for sin. Christ obeyed the law perfectly for us so his righteousness could be transferred to us. In his incarnation, he is not half God and half man. He's fully God and fully man. And as fully man, he's able to act as our representative. As fully God, his sacrifice is of infinite worth. And I want to say too that this sacrifice, while it does cover the legal matter, though it, and while it does cover sort of the debts that we have against God and they are therefore canceled or paid for, I want to underscore the point that what God has accomplished in mankind is also spiritual. That is, the plan of the Father is executed by the Son, and it is applied by the Spirit. Or to, to speak to that sentiment that I, I gave earlier, when someone says, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Let me offer this rebuttal. There are too many self-professing Christians who are religious, but not spiritual. And that is, to put it bluntly here, if you are not spiritual, you are not Christian. So says Paul. It's the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God, that we are regenerated, made spiritually alive. It is the Spirit of God who applies the saving work of Christ to us. It is the Spirit of God who empowers us to live lives of obedience. It is according to the Spirit of God that we live, not according to the flesh. This is what Paul says. We don't live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, there's sort of an important word in this text here, and it's, it's, it's um, flesh. And the Greek word behind this is sarx. And it's kind of got what we call a semantic range, lots of different meanings. Sometimes it just refers to the body, the human body, the flesh. Like, this is my arm, it's flesh. But it can also refer to fleshliness or sort of living into and, and towards sin, uh, human sinful corruption. Okay, And Paul will use it both times, uh, both ways throughout this passage. And that's just important to understand. It's not a passage that says the body is bad. It's a passage to say that humans are fallen and sometimes they live into that fallenness here. But our second point is this. So we have assurance that we are no longer, if we're in Christ, we have assurance that we're no longer under condemnation. We also have spiritual life bringing peace. And I think this passage, let me read this passage real quick. Verse five. <clears throat> Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So I think this passage really draws out sort of two things here. There is the mind and then that which governs the mind. And when we use the word mind here, I don't want you to think just about what you have cognitively in your head. Um, James K.A. Smith is a favorite author of mine. He has a great quote about this. He says, we are not merely heads on sticks. And his point is, and he's dealing with Augustine here primarily, he's like, he says, what if we're not primarily thinking things, as Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. What if we are primarily loving things? things, as Augustine argues. And so it's a very interesting point here. But I think what we want to recognize is this isn't just about what we know. The mind here, what the mind is set upon is about the trajectory of our life, what we are governed and directed towards. Uh, one of the ways I learned this best was many years ago, um, I used to ride a motorcycle in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is quite a risky thing to do, as some of you know. And uh, mostly because of other drivers, right? So I used to ride a motorcycle. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, I, I need to go get some lessons. And so I, I took motorcycle lessons. And one of the lessons that came home to me so strongly was this. Where you are looking in the road, where your head is facing, your bike will follow. So if you're driving down the road and you, and you see, oh, there's a pothole. 
and you look at that pothole and you keep staring at that pothole, you're gonna drive right into that pothole. Even if you mean to go around it, you will do so. Um, and some, you guys experience this even just driving in your car. You're driving down the road and you, you look on the side and you look, is that another Thai restaurant here in town? Another one? And you look to the side and the next thing you know, you've pulled your car over halfway into the other lane, right? Where, where the head looks, the body follows. Where, where our eyes are, the vehicle follows. Where our mindset is, our human vehicle follows. Are we living to, into the flesh? Or are we living into the spirit? Our third point here is this, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more later. We have spiritual life now and for eternity. For those who are in Christ, they have assurance that this is not just a future life to come. It's begun. It started in the here and now. Verse nine. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even through even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Now, I wanna tell you that this is an incredibly sweet passage for me personally. Um, this passage, Romans 8, 9 was the first time in my life where I felt like God was speaking to me through his word. Uh, I was just a little guy. I was about eight or nine years old. And I was reading this, actually, while we're here. <laughs> Excuse me. This was my first Bible. And it was given to me in 1979 by my grandma and grandpa. And it's just a little living Bible. And uh, in the front, they wrote a little inscription. They said, Dear Eric, I hope when you can read, you will read your Bible every day. We love you, Grandma and Grandpa Johns. It's very sweet for me. Well, I was reading this passage in Romans 8, 9, and it was the first time I felt like that I heard from the Lord by his word. And it's a really precious memory to me. I had this friend who lived down the road in the apartments at the end of our street. His name was Omar. And we both liked to ride BMX bikes, so we would hang out, and uh, his mom made some awesome salsa and um, chips, and I, I'm a sucker for chips and salsa, so I hung out with Omar <laughs> a fair bit. <clears throat> but Omar, um, while we had lots of common interests, um, we were different, and I knew we were different boys. And, um, and I didn't quite have it all um, figured out, but I knew that... Um, I knew that I was a Christian and I knew that Omar was not. And, and what I began to see was that I had an internal drive towards obedience and doing the right thing. And I could begin increasingly to see that Omar had an inclination to disobedience and to doing wicked things. And this was starting to show up um, more and, and more. And I just remember coming across this passage you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. And I just remember thinking, I had this sort of aha moment of, that's why we operate differently. It's not my family or my background or anything else. It's that God graciously by his spirit inhabits me it is working upon me to live according to the Spirit. And my friend Omar doesn't have that. The Holy Spirit is not in him. He doesn't belong to Christ, and he's not oriented to live that way. And I, I didn't have those words for it, but when I came across this passage, I, just, I had two really strong feelings. One was I was incredibly grateful um, that I was a Christian and that the Spirit was at work in me. And that I could see that. Even just as an eight, nine-year-old, I, I, this was clear in my mind, even though the verbiage would not have been. And then I also felt deep sadness because Omar did not know this. He did not have this. Um, he had a completely different operating system in him of the flesh. 
I, I like the way the Bible Knowledge Commentary put this. I'm going to read their statement verbatim here. Because of God's imputed righteousness, a believer is alive spiritually. The eternal spiritual life of God is implanted by the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ here and now, even though a believer's body is mortal. So this spiritual life has begun. We should not take by that, however, a sense of, well, fine, I can just go into autopilot. I can just go limp and be passive and let the Holy Spirit take over and let him do everything. There is a school of thought on that, and it's called Keswick theology. It's spelled with this weird W in the middle. It looks like Keswick. And you've seen the bumper sticker that summarizes it, which is let go and let God. We are not to let go and let God. We're to let God work and we're to participate with his work in our life. The better illustration, I think, is that of a sailboat. The power of change in our life is by the Holy Spirit, but put up your sails and receive it and let his work empower you. There is a cooperative work here. Um, I'll, I'll share this with you with a, sort of another, another story, another friend of mine. Uh, Omar eventually moved, and then another fellow moved in next door to me. His name was Eric. And um, Eric was super fun to hang out with, but Eric was a bad guy. <laughs> And uh, he was a bad influence on me. Um, <clears throat> Eric, um, this is a funny story. I'll tell you this story. We were out riding our BMX bikes one day uh, on a, the street behind our house. And we came across this house that had, had a house fire. It had, it had burned the previous week. And so the walls were still up, but the roof had been burned off for the most part. And two kids on BMX bikes were like, well, this has to be explored, right? So we stopped in to explore it and then felt a little conspicuous and thought, well, let's put our bikes around back so no one can see us exploring. So then we actually went inside the house. And I'm inside the house and I begin looking around and I can remember just this, this horrible feeling of, I'm in, I'm in someone's house. This isn't just a fire scene. Their pictures are on the wall. There's some of their things. And I just had this terrible, these terrible conscience pangs. And then all of a sudden we started hearing this loud noise. It just looked like whop, whop, whop. And then it started getting very windy. And so we're trying to figure out what's going on and we kind of look up in the air and the scariest vision I've had in my memory, there is a sheriff's helicopter directly over us. I can <laughs> still remember this thing. It was silver and it said in blue letters on the bottom, sheriff. And we're standing in the middle of this house looking up at this thing and he's like doing the, you know, circle around the house with nose down and we thought well what we need to do is run that's what we I need to do so we ran out of the house and we got on our BMX bikes and side by side started pedaling for all we're worth down this road and this chopper is chasing us down the road <laughs> as we're pedaling and then they start speaking to us and I have no idea what they were saying I couldn't make it out over the sound of the rotor and my own crying right you know just <laughs> I don't know what, I'm going to jail, this is terrible. We get to the end of the road and my friend Eric went left and I went right towards our houses <laughs> and they followed him. And I went home and I stashed my bike in the shed and I went to my bedroom and laid in bed and waited for the police to arrive. Um, thankfully they never did. But that was, that point in time was the point in time in my relationship with Eric changed because with Eric he was the one who would go steal a beer from the fridge Eric was the first one uh, who showed pornography to me Eric was the first one who produced a bag of marijuana when we were teenagers and Eric was one who would say let's go look in this house right so sometimes our living into the spiritual life is not just letting go and letting God, but it's making decisions consistent with God's will. I needed to sever that relationship. He needed to go left. I needed to go right. And we lost touch over the years, and I went away to college. I came back after I graduated from Biola, and my parents told me, hey, Eric's home. And uh, I said, oh, that's interesting. He came over, and he asked if I would come and visit with him. And I did. His face was bruised. He had a broken arm, and uh, he told me that he had been arrested and convicted um, of breaking and entering, <laughs> and, um, and he was getting ready to surrender himself for his jail time. 
Uh, he introduced me to his girlfriend and to their newborn child and asked if I would pray for him and for them. And I, for me, that's the strong picture of what it is like to live into the promptings of the Spirit as he works upon us and the goodness and the life and the freedom that comes from it. And the one who is living into the influence of the flesh and who finds themselves in bondage even though they are thinking they were living free. Praise God, that day, Eric went left <laughs> and I went right. And God has been very uh, gracious to me in that. We need to get to our last point here, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's, cre God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So here's the point I would want to make. We are sons of God. For those who are in Christ, we have an assurance by the Spirit that we are sons of God and therefore heirs. So there's two points I think that are critical to get from this. One is our relational connection to the Father and our security in Him. No longer slaves, servants under a fearful, oppressive master. We are adopted as sons. And you see this beautiful word here to describe the relationship between the Son and the Father. And it is Abba, not just a band from the 70s, right? It's the Aramaic word for, do you know it? Daddy, it's daddy. It's that tender word that the little one says when he or she knows they are secure with their daddy. Uh, my daughter, Eleanor, when she was very little, if I were to, she'd wake up from a nap when I'd go get her from the crib. She'd put her arms up and she would say, daddy, dad. That was her, that was her verbiage. Daddy, dad. And um, she doesn't call me daddy, dad anymore. She does call me from college and say, dad, send money. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the new, that's the new one. But I've done something here in your notes kind of overtly to pick at you a little bit. I've highlighted this word sonship. So the security of the relationship is part of it. But the other piece we need to see is this sonship piece. And this word son, particularly I think for women, some of you might be sort of bothered by this, like, hey, I'm a woman, you know, I'm a daughter. Why do I gotta be a son here? You know, don't diss my gender or something like this. And if that's what you're thinking, let me just say, oh, careful what you ask for there. Because here is in fact what God is doing in this passage. Understand that the Bible was not written to you, it's written for you. It was written in a particular time, in a particular place, each book to an audience, in a culture, about particular issues. And its timeless truths for mankind are conveyed there. And we have to understand that particular time point to get the timeless truth, right? At that particular time, in this particular culture, an inheritance was passed on through the firstborn son. So ladies, God is not dissing you by calling you a son. He is making sure you are equally treated, that you are also inheriting what is to come, that you are an equal partner in life, in salvation, and in inheritance. So the sonship that is focused upon here is for your dignity, value, and for your good, not dissing your gender. And you need to be okay with your sonship for the inheritance that it brings in the same way that I need to be comfortable with the fact that God calls me a bride. Yeah. We can be okay with these things because of what God is conveying by them. The one who is in Christ Jesus has assurance. We're no longer under condemnation. We have assurance of spiritual life bringing peace. We have that spiritual life now and in eternity. As sons of God, we have and we are heirs and have an inheritance to come. That's what it is to be spiritual. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the great efforts you've gone through to communicate how much we matter to you. Thank you for the lengths you have gone through to reconcile rebels to you. Thank you that you love us in spite of the fact that we are unlovely. God, we are thankful that you are triune. Father, you orchestrated. Son, you executed. And the Spirit, you are applying the work of Christ to us. I pray, Lord, that me and my friends here this morning would be able to say with confidence and with joy, mm, there's some spiritual folk in here. Thank you for your spirit who secures us in the family of God. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.